Welcome to a personal interview with Linda Seidel, conducted on April 27, 2006, by Alex, Part 1. L-I-N-D-A-S-E-I-D-E-L. Okay, I'll start off with some questions. Sure. Um, I read that you have been elected to be the president of a business club. I was, yes. When, when did that happen? You guys are making my brain work. Let's see, that was, um, I want to say about four or five years ago that I was the president of the La Crosse Area Business Club here. And you serve a one-year term, and the club consists of members from all different businesses in the community. Um, how did, like, tell us a little about your, like, when you grew up and stuff. Sure. I actually um, traveled all over the United States and lived in Europe for a year. My dad was a fighter pilot in the Navy, and so we traveled all over. He actually flew jets, the F-4 Phantom, um, off a naval aircraft carrier. So he would um, fly off the carrier and land on a naval ship. And so his ship would go all over, um, depending on where they were supposed to report for active duty. And our family would try and move so that we would at least be closer to where he was. Although he had to spend a lot of time on board the ship, we could see him periodically. So we did live in Italy for a year while I was in first grade. Um, and then we probably moved almost every one to two years. I went to a different school. The longest I was in any one school was my four years of college. It's the longest I had a, a residence was four years of college. While I was in college, my parents had three different addresses. So um, we moved around a lot. Um, the good side of that is I have lots of friends all over. The bad side of that is you just really never established roots in any one community. Um, and it's interesting because I had that great experience of travel that um, I, I've made roots here in La Crosse. My children actually went to Henshin Elementary School, Longfellow Middle School, and they're both now at Central High School. And so they've gotten an experience that I didn't have. They've known kids. They've gone to school with their friends that they had in kindergarten, and they'll be graduating with those friends. So that's an experience I didn't have, although they find it really interesting when we travel that I can call up a friend. You know, I have friends that are in California, friends that are in Florida, so places that we'll go travel to, I have friends. So that's a little bit of my background. And how was it, how was the feeling of it from moving house to house? Um, you learn to make friends yeah. <laughs> real easily, and you guys probably have experienced that in school where a new student is introduced in your class at some point during the year. That would have been me, um, um, because it didn't matter if it was um, the middle of the school year, the end of the school year, when um, the Navy gave your father orders to move, you moved. Um, they didn't make it convenient for you based on your school year. Um, and so you just learn to make friends. I had four siblings. I had two brothers and two sisters. And we, the five of us, became very close because of all that moving. We were kind of our own best friends during the traveling that we experienced. And um, often, um, one or two of us were in the same school together. We might have had a couple siblings that were in elementary school, a couple in middle school, and one or two in high school throughout the years. But normally, one of us always had a sibling at school with us. Okay, um, what have you been doing at the Y? Like, for? for a long time. Yeah. Since 1982, I've been working at the YWCA, and initially I started there as the activities director, so I did a lot of the youth programming, and in 1993, I became the executive director. And for many years, you guys probably don't know this, but for many years, the YMCA and the YWCA shared the building on Main Street. So both agencies shared that facility, and we balanced who got the gym on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, who got it on Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And it became real apparent to the YWCA that we were losing track of our mission, and our mission was to serve women, children, youth, and families who are struggling in the community socially and economically. And so we thought it was in our best interest to sell our 50% ownership to the YMCA, so they bought us out. And we moved to office space um, in North La Crosse, and we are better serving the women and children that need us right now. We do um, advocacy for children who are being abused and neglected, and they're involved in the courts. 
We provide housing for homeless women and children. Um, so we're tackling a lot of the tough issues. Um, we go into the juvenile detention centers and work with youth that have uh, offended, so they have a criminal record, um, and those are middle school and high school age students. So we're trying to help youth and women especially who, um, because of economics, because they're poor, and or because they might have had a bad family upbringing, need our help. So rather than doing physical fitness, although we do still do a little bit of that because we have a Hoop Fest Girls basketball program that many students here at Longfellow participate in, um, we do that and swim team because part of the mission of the YW is not only to help families and children, but it's also in to, to empower our young girls. And so we do do some sports activities, but we don't have a building, a physical fitness building. And then how does it feel to be able to go around and help other people out? Um, a lot of people say, why do you stay at that agency for so long? Because it's a nonprofit and it's tough work and we have to write grants and we um, are always asking for donations from community businesses. Um, but when you see a family that was homeless living in Salvation Army and you provide them an apartment for 12 months so that they can find employment, their kids actually have housing for 12 months, they stay in the same school for 12 months, and by that time they graduate from the program, the mom's employed and she can afford her own apartment. Even if that happens to one family a year, um, that impacts my life because it's made a difference in someone else's life. Uh, how did you get involved in the YWCA? Well, um, growing up and traveling all over, I realized there were a lot of different types of people. That's one thing I did learn is that um, you have to respect everyone my parents taught me that, um, um, regardless of anyone's race, anyone's religion, anyone's ethnicity, um, regardless of the language they might speak, um, you have to embrace everyone's differences. And I realized that um, sometimes kids that didn't seem like they were a lot like me, it was really because of th their family upbringing. And a lot of times it was because of economics. And I thought, boy, if we could help children who, just because of their economics, we could make a difference in their lives, then that was important. And those are the things I kind of learned by traveling a lot. Uh, were you in other, any other like, clubs like the YMCA? Um, well, you know, growing up in high school, I was involved in the um, different clubs at high school. And I also, in college, was involved in a therapeutic recreation club. So we helped children who had um, handicaps and disabilities. And um, we provided some um, recreational opportunities and experiences for those children. So I, I did it kind of immerse myself in, in different avenues. Um, and um, the benefit that I had growing up was um, when I left high school, I got a scholarship to college. So that paid my way to college because it was even difficult for our family with five kids on how my parents were going to try and support five children going to college. So I was fortunate that I landed a scholarship. And um, I think that what people don't realize is, I'm thinking it's not quite 30 years ago that I was in college, but in 1978, that was the year I graduated from high school. That was the first year women could receive a full athletic scholarship to college. Um, so men had been getting them all the time out of high school for many years. So it's not that long ago that women were even recognized um, as um, a person who could be an athlete and go to college. Um, oftentimes women leaving high school um, had to get scholarship monies only through academics. So it was nice that that opportunity opened um, and I'm hoping my husband will get here and bring some of the artifacts that I brought for you guys to make copies of if you'd like. Um, I have the letter that the coach who recruited me had sent me um, and have some pictures of when I was signing my letter of intent for you guys to see. But I think, again, um, that really gave me confidence that I could make a difference if someone was identifying that I was good at something. Um, it was going to help me get through college. I felt I needed to give back and make a difference after college. So you got a sports scholarship? scholarship. Mm -hmm. uh, what sport was it? Swimming. Swimming? Yep. So. Stop and save. Pardon me? Stop and save. Did you see your dad a lot when he was in the Navy when you guys were moving around? Or 
was he mostly out? He was, he was gone a lot. Um, I'll, I'll never forget his last tour of duty in Vietnam. They have what they call a fly-in, and um, the, all the pilots fly in and land on a naval base. And this was um, in, I'm trying to remember where it was, California at the time. And um, my youngest brother, who um, is now 35 or 36, he's about 11 years younger than me, um, we all ran out to greet my dad. And they had, they had um, been on an aircraft carrier, stopped in Hawaii, and picked up those flowered lays. And all the pilots wore them. And when they got out of the airplanes, they put them on their wives. And then um, my four brothers and sisters and I just charged and hugged my dad. But my youngest brother was probably only three or four at the time, and he had been gone a year, and it was his last tour of duty in Vietnam. So it was a scary time, too, because you didn't know if your dad was going to survive. And he said, are you my dad? So he didn't really even know in that short three years who his dad really was. Of course, I was 14 or 15 at the time and had many more years at home with my dad, but he could be gone a year at a time for sure. Normally his tours of duties were eight to nine months. So um, usually every two years, he could be gone eight to nine months. So it was, it was a lot. A lot of, back then it was a lot of letter writing. We didn't have computers. <laughs> so we did a lot of letter writing back and forth. Uh, how do you think you paved the way for some future women? Well, I'd like to believe that um, certainly women have continued to excel in sports. Um, I think had women not been interested and excelled, um, they might have decided not to pr continue providing athletic scholarships for women, um, at least to colleges. And so I'm hoping that um, because of that and because of my success and continuing on after college of giving back, so not only do I work the YWCA, I also volunteer coach swimming here in town. Um, I continue to give back to the sport that provided me so many opportunities. And I think that um, when young women see an older woman who has been successful, who has graduated from college, and who also participated in sports, they realize that they can do those, those very same things. And, um, you know, I have a son and a daughter, and I can truly tell you that the opportunities for my son far outweighed the opportunities th that even my daughter has had growing up here in La Crosse. Um, there was many more opportunities for my son to play sports um, than my daughter. And actually, when my daughter was interested in playing sports, when she was very young, it was always co-ed. It wasn't just girls only. And so that makes it difficult, too, for young girls. Um, I'll never forget her experience with basketball. The boys would never pass her the ball. And my son played basketball at a young age, too, and he didn't want to pass the girls the ball. So I understood that. I, I wasn't, you know, I didn't have any hurt feelings about the boys that wouldn't pass her the ball. Um, but, but I think that we have to identify that girls and boys are different and there should be girls teams and there should be boys teams. So that's even changing here locally, but it wasn't that long ago that a lot of things for at least young girls, kindergarten through fifth grade was co-ed. And you guys might not have seen that. They, I think they've gone to mostly all girls sports now, um, even in the elementary schools, but um, she's 15 now, so 10 years ago, there wasn't that many opportunities. So things are still evolving and changing, which is a good thing. How did you get into the sports swimming? Um, I think um, because we moved around so, lo so much, my mom always wanted us to be involved in an activity, and so she'd keep putting us in swim lessons, whether we liked to swim or not. I just happened to really like swimming, and I think one of my um, swim teachers, and this was in Virginia, had said, you, you know, I can't teach your daughter anymore. You should consider putting her on a swim team, and this was when I was about 11 or 12. And so the next time we moved, my mom found a swim team in the town, and signed me up and I just from that point on from when I was 12 or 13 I just loved it and um, continued to get better so that was nice too. Uh, how did you become an executive of the YWCA? Um, actually back in 1992 the former executive director um, retired and the position was open and I applied for it. I had been there as a program director for many years and Fortunate for me, they interviewed a bunch of people, but um, I was fortunate to be awarded the job and have been there ever since. So what does the executive do? 
Actually, um, I do a lot of grant writing. I do a lot of public speaking. I go out to different groups, different business groups. Um, I have to ask for money all the time to help support our programs. Um, and then I also supervise five program directors. So now we have a youth director. We have a CASA for Kids director. She's the one that helps the children that are involved in the courts due to abuse and neglect issues. We have a transitional housing director, and she helps the homeless women and children. So I supervise all of the program staff that actually work one-on-one -on -one with the, the people that we're helping. Was there anyone in your life that you were like inspired by that they helped you lead you on in life? Um, well, certainly both my parents, but I think my mom. Because I can't imagine raising five kids when your husband's out of town a lot. Um, I know even when my husband's gone for a weekend or for three or four days on business, it can get really difficult getting two kids to and from where they need to be all the time. And it's gotten easier now that they've learned to drive. But um, I can't imagine what that was like with five children back then. So um, her strength and her perseverance, I think, um, was something that I never told her when I was young because moms and daughters, at least my mom and I, fought a lot. Um, but now that we're both older, um, I call her all the time and tell her thank you. So. Not outside of the um, Cooley Region area. I stayed within the Cooley Region area, although I have gone to leadership conferences in North Carolina, in, um, in um, Scottsdale, Phoenix, Arizona, um, and they have some wonderful women's leadership program that I have been able to participate in, and um, it's been fun because I've met women from all over that um, are within the same age range of someone between 30 and 50 and um, all trying to be better leaders in their communities. Um, at the same time, many of us are moms. Um, and um, I respect the YWCA, YWCA for acknowledging that um, my family comes first. Um, even though I, I work outside the home, they do know if I have a sick child, I need to be home with that sick child. So that's been very rewarding. Um, I think that actually when my children were growing up, um, the YM and the YW were still in the same building on Main Street together. We had daycare right in that building, so my kids came to work with me every day, and I just dropped them off at the daycare center, and I went up to my office. So I really had the best of both worlds as far as a working woman, and I have gone and spoken to other businesses, large businesses um, throughout the United States that are interested in somehow having um, on-site child care for their employees, and I think that... Um, that, to me, would be the best thing that could happen if large businesses would allow women and men to bring their children to work in a daycare center right where they are um, working. Um, it's, it's very convenient. Um, you're not dropping off at a daycare and then going to work. You're just all coming to work together. And so um, it's beneficial, too, because I could stop in and have lunch with my kids, even though I was at work. And so those types of perks made working at the YW very special to me. Do you think your son and daughter will grow up to be like you? Boy, I don't know. <laughs> I think that I'm hoping that they, they find qualities in me that they admire. Um, I think they're going to be their own person for sure. Um, both of them do um, enjoy sports, so they've obviously taken a piece of that um, enjoyment of competition from both myself and my husband also um, was in sports in college as well. So um, they've both got a competitive edge um, and I think that any qualities that they find admirable, hopefully they'll take on in their adult life. Uh, what case are you most proud of, like helping the kid? Um, actually, one of my program directors just told me yesterday that one of the women that was homeless and had three children um, not only became gainfully employed, but she went back to school last year part-time. And she um, just finished her first year of school while keeping her job with straight A's. I mean, that's unbelievable to have three young children 
have a full-time job and then do night school and continue to get straight A's. And so I think that that's a real testament to the fact that when they're with the YW for 12 months, we're giving them the information that they need to be successful beyond um, our housing program. Do you have any special stories like when you were growing up or even now? Um, I do. One of the, um, the stories that I've um, actually shared with some of the League of Women Voters, those women, is that because in 1978 women didn't have full scholarships, it was the first year when I, when I walked onto the campus of Virginia Tech. Have you guys heard of Virginia Tech? Yeah. Michael Vick. Yeah, yep, true. great football player, graduated from there. Um, when you, your first week, you're going through orientation when you're a freshman in college, and then you have to go to the bookstore and get all of your books. And um, um, scholarship athletes have this um, card that they carry with them so that they know that their books are free and their housing's free and their meals are free. And so when I got into the bookstore, I noticed that there was a line specifically for the scholarship athletes. So I got all the books that I needed, and I got in line, and, you know, there was basketball players in line and football players and baseball players, and not many, not many girls were standing in line. And so I'm standing there thinking, oh, no. So I get to the front, and I show them this card, and the woman that was doing the checkout, she said, I don't know what to do with this. Um, we've never had um, a female athlete that gets everything and that has a full scholarship. And I turned around to the guy that was behind me, a bigger guy, and I said, well, what does he get for his card? And she said, everything. And I said, I guess that's what I get. So they didn't even know how to define it back then when I was 18, even though the laws had passed that women can be awarded full scholarships. So um, that, was, that was an interesting, and of course, all the guys were clapping in the line because I just said, well, what do they get? And you know, really what I wanted was just, um, equality. So it was a law that you couldn't get a full scholarship? Right. They, women were not allowed, they could get partial athletic scholarships, but not until 1978 could women be awarded full, a full athletic scholarship. So it wasn't that long ago, was it? Mm -hmm. When were you guys born? 1992. Yeah, 1992, 93. Yeah, my daughter was born in 90. So yeah, it wasn't that long ago. So it's come a long way. It's come a long way. As a matter of fact, I'm hoping my husband gets here. I just went on the internet last night and the NC2A um, Women's Swimming and Diving Championships didn't even exist when I was in college because they didn't know what to do. And actually, um, I found some of the awards that I received in college. They gave us glassware because I think they thought that after college we'd just get married and have kids. So we didn't get medals or trophies, we got glasses. And so I brought a couple of those to show you. Um, and we had these conference championship meets. Um, and it wasn't until 1982, um, when I graduated from college, that the NC2A developed uh, swimming and diving championships for women. So it's only 25 years. So w when you were in college, were you competing against men or women? Nope, just women. Um, okay. Yeah, we, we did just compete against women's teams. Um, there was a men's swimming and diving team as well, and they had been in existence for quite a while. So, and they had NC2A championships to go to. Um, so a lot has evolved for women in sports just in the last 25 years. Was there a lot of women when they, like what you did is, like when you went up to get full scholarship and all that for the swimming team? Um, there was one other woman on the team, um, Terry Estes. We were good friends. She actually um, was a breaststroker on the swim team and she was a high school All-American. And we weren't in the line the same day, and I really didn't get to meet her until our first practice. Um, and then um, she, it just actually became too much for her with academics and swimming, that after our sophomore year, unfortunately, she stopped swimming. And so I only got to swim with her for two years. But um, other than that, I think there was just two of us that had full awards coming in my freshman year. How did you get to become the, the swim team with the scholarship? Like, as in, how did you make your way there? Um, I just, you know, when in college when you're competing, um, the college kind of owns you. When you have a scholarship, it's like having a job. 
Um, I try, try and tell my kids that because they want to get scholarships to college. And my son is going to Arkansas to play baseball, and he's on a scholarship. And I say they, they pretty much own you. Um, that's your employer, and you need to perform for them. So whenever we had competition, I knew it was my job to win, to try and win and do the best that I could. So you practiced you know, early in the mornings before I went to classes, and then I'd have weight training after lunch, and then I'd go to practice again in the evening. And that really consumed my day because we practiced in the morning. I went to classes. Um, I had to do weight training normally um, after lunch. Um, and then we'd practice in the evening. And then you were required to go to study hall when you're an athlete to make sure that you're keeping up your academic grades, which is a good thing because you can't, you know, if they pay you to go to school, you better continue to get good grades because if you don't, you're ineligible to compete. And so um, I just knew it was my job to perform every time I dove into the water for that school. Uh, are you proud of all the, like from 1978 and from now, uh, how has the women's rights changed? Well, it's, it's been fabulous because of Title IX. Are you familiar with Title IX? Um, Title IX was, um, in dis actually in discussions before I even went to college. But people were identifying that um, in some schools, women didn't even have locker rooms. If there was a men's basketball team, that didn't mean there'd be a women's basketball team. And this was still back in high school. And so Title IX was incorporated so that there would be equal opportunities for women. And they've really been monitoring that and providing those equal opportunities. And in, un in some unfortunate situations, to the extent where they've hold back money from men's sports, which was not the purpose of Title IX. The t purpose of Title IX was to give equal money to the women's sports as well as to the men's sports. It wasn't to try and pull back money from men's sports and give it to the women. So um, I think that's been some of the concern is that um, although Title IX was ne needed and necessary, the intent wasn't to d deplete or take from the men's sports. It was to encourage and increase income for women's sports. So I, I am proud that um, women are now getting equal access to athletics. Uh, were there some people against you getting a full scholarship? Um, I actually, I don't think so. I never felt that. If there was, I did not feel it or hear it. Um, um, my circle of friends, they were all very supportive of the amount of time I spent swimming. I, you know, when you decide to do a sport, sometimes you don't have as much social or free time. and so. Um, my friends were very supportive and understanding if there was um, a dance on Friday night, but I was really tired from training, that I would just stay home. Um, they were okay with that. It wasn't like they wouldn't be my friends. Um, so I was lucky that I had good friends that understood that I had different goals. Did, um, did you ever get made fun of or during, when you were playing sports when you were little because of being um, you know? Mm-hmm. I did. I did. As a matter of fact, um, now it would probably be called sexual harassment. Um, I was tall and skinny, and um, I don't even know if I'll get in trouble for saying this with you guys, but, you know, I was teased because I was flat-chested because I was always, you know, participating in sports, and I, I didn't develop um, like a lot of girls in high school did at that time. So that kind of stuff would be considered sexual harassment now, which you guys understand. Um, but that kind of stuff I was teased a lot about. Um, broad shoulders. Um, you know, when um, women didn't really start a lot of weight training until probably my senior year in high school and then in college we got more into weight training and so I got teased about having arms that looked like boys arms and that kind of stuff because of the weight training but um, but again it, I didn't let those things bother me. Yeah I think you guys have done an awesome job. It's just been fabulous and Brought to you from La Crosse, Wisconsin by the Cooley Kids at Longfellow Middle School in conjunction with the League of Women Voters.